Hello and welcome. It's the Paul Leslie Hour, now celebrating 18 years of broadcasting with this very episode. We have a special guest joining us today to help celebrate this 18th anniversary. Our guest is a real legend and one of the most iconic recording artists ever in the world. Paul would like to thank everyone who's tuned in, ever, and especially today, as we meet Miss Connie Francis. The Paul Leslie Hour is made possible through viewers and listeners like you. Want to join them? Go to thepaulleslie.com. That's thepaulleslie.com and click on Support the Show. And thanks to everyone who contributes and those who listen. Now, it's the Connie Francis 18th Anniversary Special. What do you say let's get this thing started? Paul? Hello, is this Connie Francis? Yes, it is. Hey, it's Paul Leslie. How are you this morning? Hi, Paul. How are you? Oh, I'm great. Yes, Paul. Well, thank you so much for making time to do this. My pleasure. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased and honored to welcome you to the Paul Leslie Hour, now officially in our 18th year with this very show you're tuned into. And with us is one of the most illuminating and electrifying singers the world has ever known. Connie Francis has a voice that is as unmistakable as it is in a class by itself. Connie Francis is one of the most prolific recording artists of all time, and she has sung in several languages, English, German, Italian, Spanish, Hebrew, Japanese, and quite a few others. Her song, Who's Sorry Now?, was listed by RIAA as one of the songs of the century. She is one of the great all-time concert draws, Connie Francis, I'm honored on behalf of our listeners. Thank you so much. It is my pleasure, Paul. The pleasure is all mine, but is it true you prefer, despite your legendary status, you like to just be called Connie? Yes. <laughs> well, Connie, thank you so much. What has always been the purpose of the art, the singing that you create? to reach millions of people throughout the world. I wanted to, as a young child, my father talked to me about this when I was 14 years old, that he said, someday if you ever do make it, and that's a long shot, <laughs> I want you to internationalize American music. I want you to sing in German and in Japanese because they're going to be our two biggest allies. And, of course, Italian. You have to do an all-Italian album. <laughs> and this was when I was 14 years old, and I was just making demonstration records. It must be incredible, because you have one of those voices that has reached all the corners of the world. What is it like knowing that there is someone, probably this very moment, listening to a Connie Francis song? It's a great feeling. <laughs> So you mentioned Italian there, and you are of Italian heritage. Why do you suppose so many of the great American singers are of Italian descent? Well, if you ever spend a week in Naples, Italy, you'll know why. Everybody sings in, in, in Naples. Everybody sings in Italy. It's just part of our culture and part of our nature. Hmm. How did you develop your voice? I didn't. I I um, used to copy everybody else when I was making demonstration records. They would say, Connie, give us some of that good old Patty Page. Give us some of that good old Rosemary Clooney. Give us some of that good old Fuchsia Brewer. And so I was imitating everybody else when I didn't have a voice of my own until I recorded Who's Sorry Now? Because I hated the song so much I wanted to get it over with and I didn't imitate anybody else. I just sounded like myself for the first time. It seems like there's a, a huge universal lesson in that about being yourself. Yes, that's true. 
nonetheless, one of the things about many successful people is success doesn't happen over overnight. What do you think the best way to handle disappointment or adversity is? Well, one of the things that you, you must have when you set out to be a star, to be a, a star in show business, is ability to accept rejection. Because you're going to have a lot of rejection before someone comes along and says, hey, you're great. Has there been a biggest honor that you've had? The biggest honor that I had was my trip to Vietnam. That, to me, was the most unremarkable and incredible experience of my life. Why would you say that? What was it about that experience? I never felt more needed in my life. And and to bring up a touch of home to our boys over there was a thrilling experience for me. Hmm. Is it possible with all of the recordings, I've spent quite a, a, a great time going through and listening, and you have one of those catalogs. It is so rich and vast. Could you say that one of the albums, the full-length albums you made, is in particular a home run? My favorite album was my uh, Spanish and Latin American favorites. I recorded it in Abbey Road with a 72-piece orchestra, and I was 21 years old. And the, the feeling I got from that album is an amazing album. And it was also my father's idea to record a Latin album. My father was very instrumental in my career. Must have been incredible recording there at Abbey Road. As it was. This was pre-Beatles. Wow. Well, one album in particular that I really, really love from MGM Records, the one you made, Connie Francis Sings Award-Winning Motion Picture Hits. What a oh, great one. I recorded that in Rome. In Rome? Mm-hmm. Are you a big movie fan? A big movie fan. Could you say that one movie in particular is one of your all-time favorites? Oh, The Godfather. The Godfather. And without hesitation. And Gone with the Wind. Ah. You have good taste. I must have watched the movies plenty of times. <laughs> From throughout your catalog, would you say that there's a song, you, you've certainly had some great hit songs, but would you say that there was one that you would say is the most underrated that you thought didn't get as much attention as it deserved? Yes, all day long. All day long? It made the charts around 80, but it was my biggest international hit. And the, the song that was most popular when I when I sang it in foreign countries, even Romania. Now, Romania, that's a country that I have been to. I'm hoping in particular, I was reading about that, you can tell us about your experience there. Well, it was frightening because it was the first time an American singer had been invited to sing behind the Iron Curtain. And my father didn't want me to go. He thought that it was dangerous because, in his mind, I was America's Tokyo Rose at that time. He felt that my daily shows, on, my weekly shows on Radio Luxembourg, which went behind the Iron Curtain and reached countries in Tunisia and, and uh, behind every Iron Curtain country, was a bad influence on communism. And he was afraid that I was invited there to be killed. He said, you're going to come home in a box. And actually, I contracted typhoid fever there. And it was deliberate. It was deliberate, you said? Yes, it was in my food. Oh, well. Hmm. But it was 
It was, a thr- it was a thrilling experience performing for those people behind the Iron Curtain. They weren't allowed to shout out. They weren't allowed to stand up. They weren't allowed to raise their voices. They weren't allowed to whistle. They just had to stomp their feet if they enjoyed the show. And the people looked like they were in straight jackets then. Hmm. And I saw communism for the first time and all of its horror. And it's something that I never take lightly. Hmm. That communism and, and fascism are two failed doctrines. And I, politically, I'm always conscious of news media that that favors either one. Hmm. Either far left or far right. Interesting. I can I can see a lot of truth in what you're saying. Have you learned something about people having performed in so many places and in front of so many crowds through the years? Well, my two favorite people were the Scottish people and the Filipinos. I thought that they were the greatest people I ever I ever sung before. <laughs> that's so that's so interesting. Filipinos, I've been to the Philippines as well. They are uh, I hadn't been to Scotland, but Filipinos are just some of the most the loveliest people. So I have to concur with you. How, why did you do so much traveling, Paul? How did you do that? <laughs> uh, well, Romania was just recently, but I actually grew up in part in the Philippines. Uh, my parents oh. had moved there. I see. But travel certainly... So you agree with me? Oh, yeah, I so do. So you agree with me about the people? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Connie, can you think of a happiest time in your life? The night that my baby was brought to me, or he was adopted, and the night, the night he was brought, brought to my home was the happiest night of my life. Can you remember looking in his face for the first time? Oh, yes. It's indelible in my mind. <laughs> That's beautiful. I'm sure you've made a lot of people smile <laughs> with saying that. I hope so. One of the interesting things about you, you know, we've been talking about this various languages that you have recorded in, but also just in terms of styles of music. One of the albums I also enjoyed was your your country duets record. What do you think about country music? I love country music. My father instilled that in me when I was 10 years old. There was only one country station in New Jersey on Sunday afternoons, and we would take a ride in the car and listen to Paul Brenner, this disc jockey who played country music. And my father said, instead of uh, listening to the music that you're listening to, buy yourself some Hank Williams records and, and, and learn about country music, because country music has more to say than, than any other pop song you, you listen to on the radio every day. The lyrics are, are so incredible. <laughs> you just gave me a great quote. Now, what, what about doing the duets with Hank Williams Jr.? What was that like? That was fun. Hank was only 19 years old when we did that album. Has there been a favorite duet partner of yours? No, because I haven't done any duets, except with Hank and, and uh, Marvin Marion Water when I was 19. One of the people that I got to interview, God rest his soul, the great songwriter, Sir Les Reed, and he was telling me oh, about... Oh, yeah. He told me how thrilled he was with the album you made of his songs. Yes, it was a great album. Les was a very underrated uh, arranger and and writer. I mean, he wrote all of the uh, Engelbert Humperdinck and and um, Jack um, Tom Jones hits. He wrote "Kiss Me Goodbye" for for, for Tula Clark. 
and he, he, he's written some unbelievable material, and I felt that he was underrated, so I, I don't, I, um, did a tribute album to Don called the song, uh, called the songs of, uh, to Lester, it was called the songs of Les Reed. And it is one of my best albums. It's a great one. And, and he, he was fond of that record. He told me. I, I know he was. We had a wonderful time together. He was a true gentleman. Well, Connie, how do you view songwriters? Your your name inevitably comes up when someone thinks of Neil Sedaka or Howard Greenfield or, as I've been saying, Les Reed. How do you look at the songwriters that are out there? Well, Neil and Howie were responsible for many of my hits. They wrote where the boys are. They... they um, Anytime I had trouble finding a song, I would go to go back to the mills. That was Howie and, and Neil for a song. And Neil is a genius. And Howie was too, and unfortunately he passed away. But they, they were, it was fun to work with them. We were both, we were all kids together. And we were at, at the most exciting time of the record business in, in the late 50s when everything was just starting to kick, kick, kick off. Now, you mentioned earlier in the interview a lot of, of singers. And I'm curious, being that you're one of the great, great American and international singers, who would you say some of your favorite all-time singers are? Bobby Darren, Judy Garland, Frank Sinatra. I love Barry Manilow. I love Ray Charles. I like Michael Bolton. I have lots of favorites, and I and I keep them on my own playlist because I can't identify with a lot of the music today. So I I uh, go back to my favorites all the time. <laughs> Well, I'm right there with you. I was born in the 80s, and I feel the same. <laughs> right. You mentioned Sinatra, and I've always thought it was interesting that you share a birthday with him. Yes, we did. We shared a birthday. <laughs> Would you say that fame is good or bad or both? It can be, it can be bad, but it's what you make it. Hmm. It can also be very good. It can be fantastic. In what way would you say it can be fantastic? You get paid for doing the thing you love doing best. <laughs> and in the meantime, making millions of people happy. There's somebody that I want to mention. He's a mutual friend of ours. And I have to say, through the people I've met through the years, he was one of the nicest people I've ever met. And I'm talking about... Oleg Frisch. Oh, yes. Oleg is sweet, a sweetheart. Very sweet. He came to my house to interview me here. What did you think? How interesting to be, to have someone know so much about you who comes from Russia. Yeah, that was amazing to me. <laughs> we love you, Oleg, if you're listening. <laughs> what is the best thing about being Connie Francis? Um, getting reservations, <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of perks to being Connie Francis, a lot of, a lot of things that aren't good, but a lot more perks than, than not. <laughs> reservations. Do you have a favorite type of food? Italian, of course. <laughs> if I had to place a bet, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> well, it's been a great pleasure to have you here on our first show of our 18th year. And we have people listening from all. Wonderful, Paul. Congratulations on that. Thank you. Thank you. In closing, is there anything you would like to say to all the people who are tuned in? That I love them, and I love that they love me. 
<laughs> well put. Well, anybody can check out ConnieFrancis.com. Please do. And Connie, we love you. Thank you so much for spending time with us. It's a great pleasure to do this interview. I'm honored. My pleasure, Paul. All right, Connie. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you for stopping by today. If you enjoyed our program, consider telling a friend about it. The Paul Leslie Hour is made possible through people just like you. So you want to keep the show going, right? Go to thepaulleslie.com. That's thepaulleslie.com. Click on Support the Show. And thanks to everyone who contributes. Performance of the intro music is courtesy of John Primerano, the entertainer, written by Scott Joplin. End credit theme music is courtesy of John Primerano, the traditional song, Corina, Corina. Your announcer is Dan Gold. Hey, that's me. The show is hosted and produced by Paul Leslie. And we'll see you next time on the Paul Leslie Hour.